Hello, friends. So I'll be talking on very briefly on this DTR pseudomonas. So this possibly can be asked as a question in one of the DNB exams or any of the exams. Uh, so we had a panel on this in accordion meet on uh, 8th October 2023. So as a part of it, I thought it's good that we deliberate a bit. It's just a brief overview for all the trainees. So wish to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Amrita, for helping me develop this content. So the DTR is difficult to treat resistance in pseudomonas. So that is the acronym for DTR pseudomonas. And uh, this uh, acronym or the nomenclature was coined in year 2018 by IDSA. So when we look at pseudomonas, there are few uh, things that are uh, controversial. So let's look into uh, certain aspects of it. Uh, so I'll just take you to the screen. Mode. Yeah. So when we look at pseudomonas, so there is, I'm sure most of the listeners would know there is this hypothesis or a thought that we should use combination antibiotics. So where are we with regards to the usage of combination as a routine in pseudomonas? Is there a evidence and why is this become a controversy? So let's look into the evidence in this. So when we talk about combination antibiotics, there are certain distinctive clinical conditions where we talk about combination. So the combination possibly will be contemplated in patients with severe sepsis or septic shock, or it is contemplated in especially the post chemo sort of a situation where there is febrile neutropenia. So there is ample sort of a clinical justification that combination may have to be used in neutropenia. And we know for sure that in infective endocarditis, so we use combination antibiotics. So these are all defined sort of a clinical situations where combination seems to be justified. Or there is a suggestion that if there is a resistance to a antibiotic, uh, more than 10 to 15% of the bugs are resistant to the antibiotic, then maybe uh, in this situation, combination is sometimes justified. So these are some of the clinical situations where uh, combination is sort of touted. And when we talk about combination antibiotic specific to pseudomonas, so one needs to pick up the antibiotics with different mechanism of action. That is one aspect. And the second important aspect is they should be synergistic to each other. And one should uh, add, act as an adjunct to enhance the other sort of an effect or benefit. So this is these are the two things that one has to, because you cannot use combinations with a similar mechanism of actions or which come under similar class. Uh, so, uh, example is when you are using beta-lactam group of antibiotics, so possibly the combination should be another class like aminoglycosides or fluoroconolins, so on and so forth. And this is in specific to pseudomonas. So, we'll very briefly look how the evidence evolved with regards to combination. Uh, so, this was a retrospective study that came from the French group. As you see, these are little recent studies where they used a combination antibiotics in pseudomonas pneumonia. And here they found there was no effect on mortality. So this was a retrospective study. So this was an uh, this was actually a landmark study, which is an ironic study group, which came from the pain group. And this they looked in 294 patients with severe sepsis in febrile neutropenia. So as I said, febrile neutropenia is a clinical subset where combination is something that is touted and 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 uh, and argued to be better. So here, the appropriate combination did show improved survival. So this is an ironic study, which is a recently conducted uh, landmark study, uh, which has come in 2022, as you see. It did show in patients who are immunocompromised with febrile neutropenia, appropriate combination, especially in patients who come with severe sepsis, did show improved survival. And adjusted hazard ratio was 0.46, and this attained statistical significance. So it did show improved survival in this situation. And then there were two sets of meta-analysis done by Israeli group, specifically looking at uh, subgroup of pseudomonas also. This, possibly this is the largest meta-analysis published, which is 64 randomized controlled trials in 7,500 immunocompromised patients where combination treatment did not show any benefit. And they did look at the subgroup of pseudomonas also, and there also they did not see any benefit in this particular meta-analysis that came. And the same authors, the same Israeli group, then embarked on another meta-analysis. So this meta-analysis took only randomized controlled trials, 
they embarked on taking two randomized controlled trials with 15 observational studies. Again, they showed in immunocompromised patients, combination treatment overall did not show any benefit. But here, in this particular meta-analysis, which came a year after the, the one done before, in Pseudomonas subgroup, there was a mortality benefit. So, odds ratio was 0.5 and it attained statistical significance. So, this is the current evidence we have with regards to Pseudomonas. Um, as I said, in febrile neutropenia, if you have to go with a sort of an observational study, uh, it appears that in Pseudomonas combination antibiotics does seem to have benefit in patients with immunocompromised and neutropenia. And if you have to subscribe to this uh, Spain study, ironic, which is the most recent, even their appropriate combination showed improved survival. So this is the sort of evidence that we can subscribe to at this point of time. And these are all the recent studies that are cited. So now going to what do we understand by DTR? So when we talk about resistance, so gone are the days we were using the nomenclature MDR, XTR, which we, every trainee needs to know. But now the whole resistance is based on the uh, enzyme classification and the gene uh, representing this enzyme enzymatic production which confers to the resistance because of the molecular diagnostics that has been increasingly adopted to treat these infections. So when we talk about the resistance, uh, we can broadly put into these four categories with regards to beta-lactamase. So the simple sort of a resistance is, con is conferred by beta-lactamases which all of us deal with day in and day out. The second one is extended spectrum. So this, this particular thing, we call it as OSBL also, ordinary spectrum beta-lactamase, OSBL. Then we have this distinct group called ESBLs, which is extended spectrum beta-lactamases. In this, we have two classes, class A and class T, and they belong to serine group. And then we have another category called AMP-C, and this belongs to class C. So it's easy to remember, A and D are the ones which are commonly troublous. C is AMC and group B is MBL, metal beta lactamase, which I'll show you. So AMC is class C. And then you have a fourth one, which is most dreaded and most intensive deal with this problem currently, carbapenemase. So this is like a monster. So we all started with understanding the resistance of beta lactamase, which evolved into ESBL. Then we had AMC. Now we have moved to carbapenemase. And carbapenemase also divide into two major groups, which is serine and metallobetalactamases. In serine, again, you have class A and class D. A is, you have KPC. So class A and class D. A, you have KPC. Class D, you have OXA48. I'm sure all of you have heard this sort of a genetic representation of these enzymes. And metallobetalactamases, we have class B. Class B is only metallobetalactamases, where we have VIM, VIM, IMP, and NDM. So I'm sure all of you have heard of New Delhi metal beta lactamases that come under class B of carbapenemase. So this is the way we look at the classification of resistance. But the easiest one which we tend to use in our day-to-day -day practice is whether it's MDR and XDR. And all trainees need to know what is MDR. So the, the CDC or ID, IDSA definition of MDR is where there is resistance to at least one antibiotic in more than or equal to three classes. So the word you need to remember is at least one antibiotic is resistant to more than three classes, more than or equal to three classes of antibiotics. XTR is resistance to at least one in all classes, in all classes of antibiotics, except it may spare less than or equal to two classes of antibiotics. So that's the difference. So these are the cruder ways of talking about resistance, but now we have moved forward with increasing adoption of molecular diagnostics we talk about resistance based on this classification, or whether it's ESBL, whether it's AMC, whether it's carbapenemase, and in carbapenemase, whether it is serine, metallobetalactamase, and in serine, whether it's class A, class B, class C. If it is class C, it's only AMC. If it is class D, it is NDM, BIM, and DIM. So this, I'm sure many of you must have been hearing all this, but keep this image in your mind, and this is the way we look at the resistance patterns. And if you do biofire or any of the molecular diagnostics, it will tell you whether it is KPC, whether it talks about T8, so on and so forth. So now we'll talk about difficulty to treat resistance in pseudomonas. Why is this nomenclature come out in pseudomonas for specific? Because this word difficult to treat resistance was coined in 2018 because of unique ability of the pseudomonas to develop resistance in a multimodal way. So pseudomonas develops resistance 
in a multimodal way. So schematically, I have just represented, if you remember this figure, these are the ways it develops resistance. Basically, it, it develops efflux pumps where it throws out the antibiotics and where there is reduced sort of a porin manifestations or porin uh, expression. So porins are needed for the antibiotics to penetrate the pseudomonas and that, so because of reduced expression of porins, so the penetration of antibiotic does not happen. Or there is a modification of this lipopolysaccharide by the pseudomonas. And uh, pseudomonas dependent carbapenemase production also happens by these uh, pseudomonas. And uh, this, this also leads to inactivation of carbapenems. And, and so and the pseudomonas specifically alters the drug targets within its cell. And then there is a low membrane permeability it tends to develop. And then it tends to alter the antibiotics to the mucoidy component. So these are the seven sort of a multimodal ways in which pseudomonas acquires resistance. So the ones you would have always remembered is efflux pumps or more and reduced porins. And these are the other ones, the alteration of the drug targets or pseudomonas dependent carbapenemase sort of a synthesis and so on and so forth. So this is the uh, symbolic sort of a representation of how pseudomonas uh, develops resistance to multiple antibiotics in a multimodal way. So, as I said, it was this name uh, as difficult to treat pseudomonas. This can come as a short note. So, so you may have to need to know all these components. It was coined in 2018 by IDSA. And what is the definition of DTR? DTR is resistance to it is the specific word used when there is a resistance of pseudomonas to beta lactams and it is resistant to aminoglycosides or fluoroquinolones, and it is resistant to carbapenem. So you could pretty much call it as XDR. So PDR I didn't mention because it is quite intuitive, pan-drug resistance, it's resistant to all antibiotics. So basically the MDR, XDR, which you use interchangeably, you could use it for this also, but this is a specific term where you have resistance to carbapenems, beta-lactamase, and aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones. So all these three important groups it, there is a resistance. So you could use any of these words interchangeably for this. And uh, there was one study before, now we have the newer drugs. Before the availability of these newer drugs, like septazidim, avibactam, there were no drugs when they are resistant to all this because you have to resort to polystyrene. So there was one study where they used cefipim. As I said, these are the situations where combination antibiotics possibly will help. So they did one study where, in, as you see, it came in 2001, where they used cefipim plus amic acid, and survival was 69% for these XTR pseudomonas. So IDSA defines that if you identify DTR pseudomonas, one needs to categorize it into UTI, urinary tract infections, and non-UTI, and the choice of drugs should be determined based on this. So here, why DTR pseudomonas is important is the choice of drugs that are available to treat DTR at this point of time are very few. Because once you take out carbapenem, aminoglycoside, fluoroquinolone, bitalum, there's hardly any antibiotics that you have in your armamentarium. So there's only one possible at this point of time, all of you are aware, which is effective is septazidine, avibactam. And so the drugs of choice for treating DTR, there is more emphasis on using the newer cephalosporins as compared to carbapenems when you are dealing with DTR pseudomonas. So septazidim, avibactam is the drug that is currently available, which you could use for DTR. And there is a new study also that is come, looking at its efficacy, which I'll show in the next slide. The newer antibiotic, which every trainee need to be aware, and possibly these antibiotics will make their way to India, is septalozone, tazabactam. So this is also effective, and it is recommended against DTR pseudomonas. And imipenem, plastin, relibactam. So imipenem, relibactam, this is also unavailable in India. So it, it is available in US. So this will also possibly make its way. And this has this is also one of the drug of choice. And this is a magic drug, Cephiderocol. So compared to these, why they put as UTI and non-UTI is in non-UTI, they have specifically mentioned if there is an evolving resistance to septazidim abibactam, the only drug that one can be depend on at this point of time is Cephiderocol because this is one drug which is found to be more potent even in non-UTI, where there is higher MICs for septazidine and abibactam. So these are the newer drugs which you all should keep in mind because these are the only choices which are available as a first choice. 
if suppose for some reason you are not able to use any of this then the second choice which every of my listener in india is very familiar is the polystyrene polymyxin and polystyrene so second choice will be combination of polymyxin or polystyrene because obviously you cannot use polymyxin for uti if it is uti you have to use polystyrene if it is non uti you can think of polymyxin need to be combined with amino glucoside is the suggestion or recommendation from the idsi and the other drug that you have in your armamentarium is phosphomycin so these are the choices if you do not have availability of this first group of drugs so and with regards to what is the evidence of effectiveness of ceftazidim avibactam against dtr so this is this study which is come from uh, us group erase pa study for all the trainees because this is the most recent study came published in 2021 where they have looked specifically at carbapenemase resistant enterobacteria pseudomonas and they have used ceftazidim avibactam as a drug of choice and it was found to be 72% effective and the bugs were susceptible to 72% of the time so this so it showed that ceftazidim avibactam is still a good drug at this point of time in our country for dtr pseudomonas so that's about the dtr so very brief over oversight or overview on this particular topic and uh, this, is, this is a good topic that uh, one should keep in back of mind and the newer antibiotics that you can uh, take home as a message is ceftazidim avibactam which are all aware semipenem relibactam ceftazidim and ceftalozone tazabactam so these are the newer drugs the second choice would be polystyrene uh, along with aminoglycosides and phosphomycin as a salvage drug so i request all the listeners to present their valuable work to our journal of acute care which comes every 3 months uh, so we publish uh, original articles case reports video cmes pictorial images and there is a trainee corner as well in this so I request you all to visit my website uh, www.drpragapa.com to read to this lecture so thank you thank you one and all